several universities and the World Economic Forum on shaping uh, a new set of rules for the world. So I'll touch on these in a bit. And then I will also sh shift to the other side of my brain and share with you a little bit about my work <coughs> as a business person. Uh, I've built several companies and sold one to IBM, just sold a, a second one to Oracle, uh, but I'm now an investor. I buy companies as well. Uh, I'm a computer scientist uh, engineer uh, at Kroll. That's my background. Uh, but I shifted mostly towards the business. So I'll give you some, some stories from that. But before I get into the first part, let me just share with you that um, right now in the world, we have a true deficit in trust. It's a huge deficit. Professor Joe and I, I'm a fellow at Harvard Kennedy, and Joe's a mentor in many ways. He, he was the dean of Harvard Kennedy, and he, he tells me now that he's retired that the biggest deficit on the planet Uh, there is a great report that comes out every January called the Trust Barometer. It's done by Edelman Communications. You can look it up, it's online. And every year they show the level of trust people have around the world in our various institutions. And needless to say, the Trust Barometer is just down. First, we lost trust uh, in governments. Then in 2008, we lost trust in the financial system. Uh, of late, technology companies, which every year for the last 18 years have gained trust, have started losing trust. I don't need to tell you why. You can just look at the news to find out that uh, as our lives shift to the digital space, we frankly just don't know who knows what. Um, when I was at IBM, I remember asking some people, you know, when, when Watson takes the data from my Apple Watch as to what I've done in terms of my movement and combines it maybe with some data from my doctors about my last blood test, combines it with X and Y and Z, and then decides that uh, Fadi's lifespan is probably only six years. <laughs> Who owns that data? And where does that data go? Can they share it with my doctor, with my wife, with me? What are the rules? And I remember very smart people at IBM saying, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But it's our data, because it's not the data we took from you or from your watch or from your doctor. It's metadata that our AI algorithm came up with. So it's our data. So these kind of complexities we're living with that are also reducing the amount of trust in the world. And that's a fact. It's a very, very big problem. We now have uh, very little revelations that are coming out about how Facebook used uh, some of this data, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so to get into that subject, let me give you a five minute primer on how the digital world is governed, because that's the world I live in. Can I just go to the first slide quickly? Is it uh, the clicker or switch? So this is a slide I created actually to explain uh, this, uh, this complex world. I did it to explain it to heads of state and to uh, when I met Antonio Guterres the first time, that's why I walked into it. I, I made this his dinner uh, plate and we sat down and talked about it. But I won't go into the details, but for many people who frankly see the whole digital world as their iPhone or their phone, there is a lot beneath that that uh, needs to be governed. And my work on the global scene is to figure out how to govern that space. So I divide the digital world into three layers. The infrastructure layer is essentially the, all the networks that make up the digital infrastructure. Today in the world there are 76,000 networks that make up what we call the those networks are owned by companies like AT&T and Verizon and China Telecom and France Telecom. They own these networks. So this is not a public infrastructure. This is a distributed private infrastructure. Connected to those networks are today about 26 billion things that talk to the networks. In this room, we probably have 500 of these 26 billion. 
And by the way, the predictions are that by 2030, there will be about a trillion things talking to those networks, including potentially my heart valve, maybe my eye, maybe, uh, you know. So in this room, there will be probably a thousand times more things talking to me, not just the thermostats, but maybe us, maybe our brains, maybe the environment maybe every physical piece here. All of this is getting sensorized and will be connected to those networks. That, that's just happening. You may hear the term IOT, Internet of Things. That means there's a whole new internet of things talking to the internet. Not just machines, things, and potentially biological things like our bodies. So that's the infrastructure. That's the fabric of the internet. Now, this orange layer is the least understood layer, but I have to dwell on it for a minute, because if this picture was better, it would look like an hourglass. The orange layer would be the neck of the hourglass. Why? Because I just told you there are 77,000 networks here, and there are billions of things in the digital world connected to them. So how is it that we have one internet? We don't have two internets, we have one internet. What makes all those things look like the one internet is this layer, okay? And that layer was created by the US government in the late 90s, uh, and then it became an independent agency, and I ran that agency for four years. That agency is essentially the body that makes sure the internet resources the core resources of the internet, the IP addresses, the domain names, all these things that make you type www.fordham.edu on your phone or on your computer in Cairo or in LA, and you always get to the same computer at Fordham University called fordham.edu. You, you never type IBM.com and ended up at Domino's Pizza, did you? It always works because of this layer. So that's the layer that makes the whole internet look like one internet. If that layer is broken, then we will have multiple internets. So keep that in mind because I'll come back to that point later. And that's today run uh, by the same agency I was the head of until 2016. Now, these are the parts of the internet most of you don't see. They're down there. Now, everything in the blue layer, you see every day. These are the things you do every day on the internet. You interact with your health records, you deal with financial information, media. All of this is the blue layer, and we call this the economic and societal layer. This is where most of us live and work. Now, I'll stop here because I typically spend two hours explaining this, but we don't have this. The question I'm going to ask you is, who governs this layer? Who governs this layer? And who governs that layer? Who runs this? Now you may tell me, oh, governments in the UN. And, no, no, remember one thing. When Vint Cerf and Crocker and all these guys created the internet, these are the guys who created the internet. They made it so that it's not a national system. They also made it so it's not an international system. They made it so it is a transnational system. The internet does not know where you are and doesn't care about the national boundaries of your country. It is designed to be a transnational system. And so all of our governance systems on the planet today, jurisdictional, uh, legal, cultural, they're all built around the nation state model and the international system of organizations that live above it. But all of these institutions right now are failing to govern us. It doesn't work because there is a disconnect between a transnational structure and how the world is governed today. So who governs this today? It's distributed, but it's largely the ministries of communication with the companies working together. So in the US, for those of you in the US, that would be, let's say, the FCC would be looking after this. Who governs this? This was the agency I ran called ICANN, which is not run by any government. It is not run by any business. It is run by all the stakeholders working together. It's a very unique model. We don't have this in the world, but that's the model we need more of. 
we need more institutions that are based on the idea that citizens, businesses, and governments can come together and build policies for the transnational world. That's what ICANN is doing today. And that's unique. That's why at Harvard and Oxford, when I worked at the government schools, we're explaining how that model works, this unique model of managing things as a community. Who governs the blue land? Nobody. Hence the problem. We do have, right now, a government vacuum around that area. So when uh, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg says, I'm doing my best, and he may be, he should take him for his word. But the question is, his best based on what? And on whose rules? And who is he accountable to? These are the big questions we don't have answers to today. So companies, very large companies, I won't mention names, have disbanded, for example, their ethical boards that were able to tell the CEO, you can't do this, this is going really far, because they're starting to find that uh, there, are, there is a need for rules and they're not sure where to get those rules. So they set up ethical boards, ethical boards stop them, so they disband them, they try something else. Now, you have Tim Cook, head of Apple, you have uh, Mark Benioff, head of Salesforce.com, publicly in the last two weeks saying, we need more regulation. Have you ever heard business people say this? <laughs> this should tell you something. This is now a, a, you know, a, a scream from inside saying, we need help. We don't know what to do. Right? And they're getting it. So this is the area where I'm focused right now. I'm now going to tell you two stories because they're related to this picture. I was head of ICANN when Snowden revealed that there was a lot of uh, snooping going on, allegedly. And so governments became very worried. I mean, uh, Angela Merkel heard that her phone was right. I mean, uh, Dilma Rousseff heard that her phone was right. Very upset. You remember Snowden came out in April 2013. In September 2013, the UNS General Assembly always opens with the Brazilian president. I don't know why, but it does always. And Dilma Rousseff stood up and made a very impassioned speech about the need for rules. This is crazy. I'm the president of a country. How could my phone be public? Now, I went to see Dilma literally a month after that speech. Kofi Annan had called me at the time and he said, she was mad and she spoke for a lot of people in the room. You should go see her. So I went and I camped outside of her presidential palace. I had no status. I'm just the head of an agency. So I show up and I say, hey, she doesn't want to see you. And I say, I need to see her because it's a problem. And if the world thinks that some of these layers are being used for harm, we need to clarify that for them. So I don't speak Portuguese. I couldn't get through her day. I waited the first day, the second day, and then the third day, across the palace of the Marusa in Brasilia, there is a beautiful church, gorgeous church. I don't know if you know how Brasilia was built by a very nice architect and he had a specific plan. And in the middle, right in the middle, between all the ministries and the presidential palace, there's a church dedicated to Snowden. So I went to that church and I camped there. I literally camped there. I would go every morning to the presidential palace, ask for a meeting, they said no, and come back to the church until they gave me a meeting. And you could look it up online and see what occurred in that meeting. Because in that meeting, I walked in and her minister sat around the table all told her, don't listen to him. Don't listen to him. And uh, she listened. I sat right next to her. And I explained to her how all of this works. And I had frankly put all my effort to be sincere with her about exactly how this works. And Dilma Rousseff told me, I believe what you're saying. We should not break the internet. Because at the time, this was about to be broken into. It was so tense because of Snowden that 
the Chinese had told Lima, he said, let's have the BRICS countries build their own orange layer. And then we have two completely separate entities. And that would have really broken, in my opinion, the only piece of the internet, the, the, the next yard glass that made the internet one internet for the world. And the internet brings bad things equally to everybody, but it's also a platform that unites us. So I was committed to keep it as one internet. And Dilma, at the end of the meeting, said, we shall. She walked out, we did a press conference, and asked me when is Easter. This meeting was in November. I said, well, I'm Orthodox. Let me check quickly when is <laughs> Easter. And it was 24th of April. She said, great. That day, I'm going to hold a big conference in Sao Paulo to tell the world we should keep it as one. So this was a small effort that where we put truth and where we truly speak to powerful people about the importance of keeping us as one. It works. I have no magic wand, <coughs> but that's what we did. <coughs> of course, immediately, I got a call from Beijing, and they said, you must have given Brazil something. You must have given them some maybe key codes to this orange layer. Because this orange layer, and this is a discussion for another day, has 13 servers around the world that control it. And I was in control of these 13. And China always wants one of these 13. And we always said no. So they thought I gave Brazil one of the 13. Right? So I went to Beijing. And Beijing was so upset at Brazil backing off, breaking the internet, that they wanted to see me face to face and ask me, what is it we gave the Chinese, uh, the Brazilians? And once again, the head of China's Cyber Administration, reporting to President Xi, and I spent days together talking about this, and we became very close friends, very close friends. And the way we did it was by speaking truth, by being truthful about what is happening, what is possible, what is not possible. In this world of governance that's very fraught with lack of trust, always thinking that the other party is trying to do something to really take something away from your people. Having a moment of truth with powerful people goes a long way. And China, after my meeting with Liu Wei, who frankly even came to my home and spent time in my home in, in LA, China, and we met with Premier Li, and China announced in London next year, one internet for the world. We are not breaking the internet. So these are moments that I wanted to share with you. Moments where, frankly, if we take uh, the basic beliefs we have in the importance of being truthful and open and working together, we can actually go a long way in maintaining some integrity in the structure. Now, this does not stop many of the problems we still have. And we're now working with the United Nations with Secretary General to come up with a regime that takes some of this, these concepts of um, transparency, of inclusivity, of openness, of truthfulness, of uh, integrity, and build them into a new governance model for those parts of the internet. And uh, I'm heading to the Silicon Valley next week. I'll be meeting the CEOs of Airbnb and Twitter Planet Labs, and you know, I'll give you just an example. I was uh, in Seattle to see one of Bill Gates' new companies. He and Amazon spent a billion dollars to start up this company. We'll have, within three years, around the, the orbits of the Earth, 150 satellites that take real-time video of every square inch on our planet at 72 centimeter resolution. Wonderful technology. Next question. I'm sure I, you or I will be using it to check what is my neighbor barbecuing. That would be a wonderful thing. But the reality is, what are the rules that will govern where the video goes? And you know, if it's in the sky, you can't reach it. It is taking a video of 
every square inch of the planet, 24 hours a day, at 72 centimeter resolution. So all of this is happening in real time. <coughs> and I think there is an opportunity, a beautiful opportunity, and a, and a responsibility to actually engage with businesses, with governments, and with citizenry to start building a framework of rules so that businesses, as they're entering all these ventures, they have some idea how to apply the great technologies they're doing. That is lacking today. And the opportunity <coughs> is here. And I'm inviting all of you, as citizens, as practitioners, as business people, as whatever you do, to actually take part responsibility in this. We can't just be pointing at CEOs or governments or civil society groups. We are all responsible for how this regime develops. Let me finish by switching to my business uh, work. I am a, I'm a partner in a private equity firm. We buy companies. And so what we do in private equity firms is we have partners come up to a, uh, a meeting every other Monday, and they say, hey, I found this business. I want to buy it. What are the characteristics of the business? What do they do? What are their financials? And of course, once in a while, we hear uh, a business that uh, kind of turns something inside of you, you know, makes you think a little bit. Um, without naming names, in the last month, one of our partners presented a fabulous business. This fabulous business, over $180 million of net EBITDA profit every year. Very big business, very successful. And of course, all of us were listening very carefully because that's impressive. And it was for sale, and we had a shot at buying. When we looked a little bit into the business, we found out that this, this is a business that has developed very, very sophisticated algorithms on the internet to actually uh, capture people in certain situations and offer them uh, certain services, and I won't mention them this because <coughs> it's, it's delicate, uh, that frankly took advantage of them. Okay. Very successful money standpoint, from a financial standpoint, it's an amazing success. And I was watching my partners very carefully to see what they were seeing. And it's very interesting because it's at moments like this, when all the numbers look like that, that you actually know cool people are not cool. And in moments like this, all of us, me included, we have a responsibility. We, we can't just, uh, we have to have certain criteria come out that define <coughs> who we are right at these moments. And uh, I, I must tell you, the, um, the, the current is definitely focused on the upswing of bar. Uh, the values that are embedded in that business uh, were not necessarily critical so we engage in the battle. We talk about battles. And one of the partners asked, for example, hey, what if uh, a good New York Times reporter figured out how that business works and you know, has stories out in the Times about that business? How do you think we would react? How do you think the business would be affected? Um, and even though this was more defensive rather than a proactive way to address the issue, it nonetheless made the partners start to have a discussion. And I engaged and I was engaged in really creating new criteria for how we make decisions about businesses. So I think we can engage also in very, very capitalistic, I am, I'm a capitalist, I'm involved in buying companies and selling companies every day, but uh, that doesn't make us necessarily have to drop Every, everything we believe in. Uh, and it pays, it pays for us to say these things. Uh, I will finish by telling you about the business I went uh, to visit. They were asking me to invest in it. This is 
small business, so this was a personal investment, not my firm. And I walked in, and uh, the CEO was 27. We had employees who were in their 50s, but he was 27. And as soon as I walked into their office, he said, before we show you the business, before you meet anybody, I want you to read this first. These are our principles. And frankly, he told me right up front before I even read them, he says, if those are not workable for you, then maybe you're not the right investor for us. This is a small business. All they want is cash so they can grow. But he, he said, these are, this is what everyone in this room who's working believes in. So I copied them. And I'll just finish by reading. This is a 27-year-old CEO. Number one, love is our greatest asset. If we have love, we have everything. Number two, we will be the best at our craft, and our success will give us confidence. But we will never be arrogant towards each other or others. Our ecosystem fills us with love. Every living thing and entity within it will receive our respect, loving attention, and care to ensure that it flourishes. Money is important. We need it to thrive, but it will never be our pure motivator. In addition to practicing the golden rule, we will also be masters of empathy, always listening and observing how we can better serve each other, our community, and those in need. And then the last one, the best investment we can make is love. Love is everlasting, all triumphant, and impervious to greed. By investing in those who need love, we plant the seeds for limitless growth for our community. I told him, who wrote this? He says, I did. And that's the first thing I do when I meet an investor or an employee or a partner. This is a high-tech company. These guys are competing in a very tough environment. But you should, of course, I frankly invested immediately without even asking in detail how they're doing they're doing. Because this cannot fail. And this is not emotional, but this cannot fail. Before I came to see you, I was with the CEO of the largest ad firm in the world, right here in New York. And he was telling me every major brand in America is coming to us and asking, how can we put purpose into our brand. How can we put purpose into our brand? I bet you guys have some good answers for that. <laughs> and that's it. We put purpose in any work we do, uh, purpose that is based on who we are and changing the world. Good to see you all. I'm going to catch a flight to LA. <laughs> Take care.